right, peace and blessings, everyone. I always like to begin with what time it is. And a great African scholar by the name of Dr. Benjamin E. Mays said, it's 11.59 on the clock of destiny. And life is like a minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon you, can't refuse it. Didn't seek it, didn't choose it. But it's up to you to use it. You'll suffer if you lose it. Give account if you abuse it. It's only a minute, but eternity is in it. And with that minute, you, me, and we can change and transform the world. I am honored to be with you today to share a few words and ideas on the topic of the mentality of the Maroons. Mentality of the Maroons. Uh, let me uh, first um, bring greetings from Clark Atlanta University School of Education, where I am very proud, blessed, and pleased to serve on the faculty in the Department of Educational Leadership. I also want to bring you greetings from Saba Academy Online, which was founded by my wife, Willette Akua, where we're bringing out the brilliance in our children with online tutoring and teaching using the Reading Revolution online curriculum. It's customary whenever African people gather that we begin by giving honor to the Most High who is known by many names and worshiped in many ways. Certainly the one source and the one force through which we all live, move, and have our being. It's also customary that we give honor to our ancestors because there's an African proverb which says, if we stand tall, it is because we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. Or as Dr. Jacob Carruthers has said, indeed our stride is wide because we're walking in the footsteps of giants. Of course, one of those uh, giants in whose footsteps uh, we're attempting to walk and on whose shoulders we're endeavoring to stand tall is none other than Nana Bafur Amenkwetia II also known as Dr. Asa Hilliard III. And certainly he was no stranger to the Auburn Avenue Research Library and the wonderful work that he did at Georgia State University and also did a great deal of work visiting on the campuses of the Atlanta University Center. And so we welcome his presence and guidance in this presentation. We wanna make this local event a global event. So I wanna invite you to take screenshots and to share anything that you find to be of interest to you on social media. Um, and, and feel free to tag me on it, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. And as you know, if you've seen me speak before, then you know I show a lot of pictures and images because we know that a picture is worth a thousand words. And so I'm reminded uh, of the great words of Lister Vell Middleton who says, sharpen your eye and tune your ear so you know what you see and understand what you hear. You'll have to look with more than just your two physical eyes. You'll have to look with what our ancestors called the ujat. Now, some people call it the third eye, but we know it's really the first eye, the first eye of intuition that allows us to see beyond the physical realm and dig deep into the mental and spiritual dimensions. So once again, sharpen your eye and tune your ear so you know what you see and understand what you hear. So if you're ready to get started, let's jump right into it. We're going to be talking about the mentality of the Maroons, the mindset of the Maroons. And this presentation is broken into several sessions, about three or four sessions. Any session will probably be maybe about 10 minutes long. Uh, but the intent is to share some information in digestible portions so that it's easy to understand and easy to receive. So session one is going to be dealing with origins. When I say this title, Mentality of the Maroons, the question may arise in your mind, well, what is a maroon? And that's a great question. Matter of fact, that's a question I had many years ago when someone handed me this book by Dr. Asa Hillier called The Maroon Within Us. The subtitle was Selected Essays on African-American Community Socialization. But again, it was hard for me to get past anything until I found out what a maroon was. And then uh, I found out the answer. You see, maroons were Africans who refused to be enslaved. The word maroon comes from the Spanish word cimarron, meaning wild cow or escaped cattle 
living in the wild. Maroons escaped and created communities in the swamps of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, but they also escaped into the hills and mountains of Jamaica and other islands of the Caribbean, Central and South America. So when he calls the book, The Maroon Within Us, as a psychologist, Dr. Hilliard is calling attention to that part of us that refuses to be enslaved. That, that there's a part of us that, that is observing everything that's going on in our families, in our communities, and in the world. And we're looking at the forces and factors in society that attempt to oppress us, but there is a part of us that is attached to our creator, that refuses to be bound, that refuses to be oppressed, and that refuses to be enslaved. And that is the part of us that Dr. Hilliard is speaking to in this book. He also tells us that Maroons were completely self-sufficient and self-determined to remain that way. One more time, Maroons were completely self-sufficient and self-determined to remain that way. Now, when someone has been enslaved, they are very skillfully mentally manipulated into believing that someone else will provide their needs for them, that someone else will provide for them what they should be providing for themselves. But a maroon is completely self-sufficient and determined to remain that way. I want you to remember that third point. He also tells us that accepting the unnatural as normal without criticism is virtual insanity. So back during the times of the Ma'afa, the catastrophic interruption of African sovereignty and civilization, back at the onset of our captivity, there were those who were terrorized into accepting the unnatural as normal. They were terrorized into accepting the notion that we should be working for free or next to free. They were terrorized into accepting the notion that we were inferior. They were terrorized into accepting the notion that we could not rule over ourselves and provide for ourselves. They were terrorized into accepting all of these things so that we would lose our self-determination and sense of self-sufficiency. As a matter of fact, it, it, the, the, the system was, was so deeply entrenched that there were those that would develop a term for those Africans who chose to attempt to escape. Not only did they come up with the term Cimarron or Maroon, but there was a psychological assessment of those that attempted to escape, and they were diagnosed to have dreptomania. Can you imagine that? Dreptomania was a psychological disorder that Africans were said to have when they tried to escape enslavement. And this is why Dr. Hilliard tells us, again, accepting the unnatural as normal and without criticism is virtual insanity. And so there always have to be those among us who are constantly giving a critical cultural critique of what's going on in our communities, in our nation, and in the world. And we should never accept the unnatural as normal and without criticism. Otherwise, we end up insane. And so there were those uh, Africans who escaped but those Africans who escaped cannot necessarily be said to be maroons because Dr. Hillier calls our attention to the concept of escape from escape. Let's see what he means by that. He says there were maroons who escaped, but then there were those captive Africans who sought to escape from escape. What does he mean by this? He's saying they turned away from any quest for self, excessive indulgence in entertainment, alcohol and drugs were the pathways. Do we not see that today as well? Excessive indulgent in entertainment, weapons of mass deception, weapons of mass distraction, 
right? Excessive indulgence in entertainment, alcohol, and drugs were pathways. This sense of escape from escape. In other words, you have those Africans who were organizing and mobilizing, bringing people together. They were on the move, educating the people of the best ways to escape and preserve their culture and to achieve freedom and liberation and sovereignty. But then there are those who just wanted to escape from escape. I don't want to hear all that black stuff. I don't want to hear any of that kind of stuff, right? Escape from escape. And in attempting to escape from escape, they indulge in excessive indulgence in entertainment, alcohol, and drugs. These are the same things that we see going on today. So again, it's important that we understand the difference between escape versus maroonage. You see, simple escape and simple freedom were liberty without an aim, liberty without an aim. But maroonage, on the other hand, was freedom for the purpose of survival and cultural continuity, okay? So it wasn't just freedom to go and sit on the bus next to anybody that you want to sit on. It wasn't just freedom to go to any restroom that you wanted to or to drink from any drinking fountain. Certainly, these were things that we're thankful for our elders and ancestors for fighting those battles for us, because we do have the human right to do those things. But maroonage was very, very different from that. Again, maroonage was freedom for the purpose of survival and cultural continuity. But not only that, the ability of us to rule over ourselves and not allow ourselves to be ruled over or controlled by others. That's a very serious distinction and critical distinction that we need to make. I'm very thankful to one of my teachers, Grandmaster Baba Taji Nanji, who is a tremendous cultural and community treasure amongst us. Um, he is very well known in the community um, as a martial artist and as a personal protection specialist. Uh, he's also known as an outstanding educator and, and many other things. Uh, He's been an amazing contributor to the community for, for decades now. But I'm calling his expertise uh, to your attention because he's the one that began to teach me in his instruction of the martial arts about ancient Africans' tra uh, traditions of warriorhood, maroonage, and personal protection. So if we're gonna talk about uh, the maroon within us, we have to go back to a time when we were not being dominated by other people to see what we were doing to protect ourselves from that, okay? And so one of the places and one of the people that Grandmaster Baba Taji Nanji um, directed my attention to was uh, Brother uh, Baba Balagun, Abigunde. And he has a book called African Martial Arts, Discovering the, World, the Warrior Within. Now in this book, he tells us that the oldest evidence of the combat arts dates back to 2800 BC in Africa in ancient Kemet. So you may say, well, well Brother Chico, why are you talking about the, the, the combat arts, the ancient combat arts? Because in order for a maroon to be a maroon, before they could escape, they had to defend themselves. They had to rise up. They had to take arms. They had to make a self-conscious, self-determined uh, decision to take arms and seek their freedom, their liberation, and their sovereignty. And we'll talk about the difference between freedom and sovereignty a little bit later. So we have to look at some of the warrior traditions that went on in Africa so that we'll understand how these captive Africans kept those warrior traditions alive in order to achieve maroonage and sovereignty. So uh, Baba Balagun tells us that the oldest evidence of combat arts dates back to 2800 BC in Africa and ancient Kemet. On the walls of the tombs of Beni Hassan, there are over 500 fighting figures demonstrating the ancient African Kemetic advanced knowledge of weapons, kicking, striking, joint locks, and throws. It was a complete system of combat. This is another picture coming from the walls of the uh, temple at Beni Hassan. And there were uh, African scholars and, and, and martial artists who have studied these glyphs very, very carefully and tested the application of these glyphs. As I said, joint locks, throws, kicks, punches, 
stick fighting, all sorts of different things to be able to demonstrate the effectiveness of this complete combat system. Now we can also go to the research of Dr. Renoko Rashidi, peace be upon him. He was certainly Ma'at Keru, meaning true of voice. And he made his transition earlier this year while he was in Egypt. So we send ancestral blessings his way. But he tells us in his book, African Star Over Asia, the black presence in the East, there's a Japanese proverb which says, for a samurai to be brave, he must have a bit of black blood. And for those of you who are familiar with Dr. Rashidi's work, he tells us a great deal about the African presence in early Asia and the in, not just the presence, but the influence of Africans in Asia and in particular in the fighting arts. As early as 1926, when Drusilla Dungy Houston released the book, Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire, 10 of the 17 chapters in that book focus on the African presence in early Asia, okay? So when we look at the origins of the so-called martial arts, we are very, very clear about where they began. Now, this is not to take anything away from, uh, from Asian martial artists or those that are practitioners uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Certainly, they have mastered many of these different uh, kinds of arts, whether from China, whether from Japan, whether from Korea, uh, or, or any of the other Asian nations that have mastered the different martial arts. But it is important to understand that we as African people were the originators and that we passed on these arts to many different indigenous people around the globe. And all people have their fighting arts and we certainly have ours as well, okay? And, and so Baba Balagoon tells us that Asia's link to the African martial arts dates back to the Dravidians of India and the Moors of Africa. The Dravidians were descendants of India's older black civilization, the Harappan, who migrated to Africa, uh, from Africa to India. And now I wanna talk about, since he mentions the Moors, let's talk about uh, their involvement in this. Because as I began to train um, with Grandmaster Baba Taji Nanji, I noticed that we were doing a lot of what today would be called the Filipino martial arts. And we were doing stick fighting and different things of that nature. And one day I asked Bob, I said, Baba, if, if your Imafi blend system, he is the creator of the Imafi blend system, which is an African-based martial arts uh, system. Uh, however, Grandmaster Baba Taji Nanji uh, has 15 black belts in a number of different arts, okay? And so I said, well, if this is an African-based system, why is so much of what we're doing coming out of Filipino martial arts and with the stick fighting and different things and, uh, and knife fighting and knife defense and different things of that nature? He said, well, he said, the uh, art of Kali coming out of Filipino martial arts, uh, there's a part of the Philippines, the Southern Philippines, uh, which is referred to as Moro Moro. And it's called Moro Moro in recognition of the Moorish contribution. And so the Filipino arts have preserved a lot of the Moorish traditions of stick fighting and knife defense. And certainly Baba Balagoon records this again in the book, African Martial Arts Discovering the Warrior Within. He says that the Moors, African warriors and scholars who adopted Islam as their way of life brought the martial arts to Indonesia and the Philippines over 1,000 years ago, giving the indigenous people the arts of Eskrima, Kali, Arnis, and Pinchak Sila. In fact, the Filipino martial arts are still referred to as Moro Moro in recognition of the Moorish contribution. So with these things in mind, what I would like for you to know is that we have a very, very distinguished tradition of excellence and innovation in the fighting arts. Now, this is going to come in very handy and will be very important 
when Africans start to seek their freedom in the midst of attempted captivity. When Europeans attempt to enslave us, these fighting arts will become very, very important. Now, I do want you to know that we have a number of resources to continue to educate you even after this particular presentation. One of those resources, you can go to www.freeintrotoafricanorigins.com. Again, freeintrotoafricanorigins.com. On this platform, uh, on that platform rather, it will send you six free videos. When you put your email address in, it will send you six free videos, one per day for six days straight on a variety of different topics relative to African origin. So I encourage you to take advantage of that free uh, resource. Again, it's called Free Intro to African Origins. All right. So now that we've talked a little bit about origins, let's now talk uh, in session two a little bit about resistance. Because one of the key components in the mentality of the Maroons is their sense of resistance, not allowing certain things to happen. See, there are certain things, you've heard it said before that, that there are people uh, who watch things happen and there are people who make things happen. And then there are people who wonder, man, what happened? Right. No, the Maroons were those that made things happen. They didn't just watch things happen. They resisted oppression. And we need people today who will resist oppression wherever they may happen to see it. And resisting oppression, part of that may be speaking out about it, but that's not all there is about it. Another part of that would be fighting back against it, but that's not all there is about it. We have to create realities and communities that are that repel oppression and that are resistant to oppression and we'll get to that a little bit later but it's very important for us to understand that in large measure we were not taught about those africans who won in the battle against oppression and slavery now herbert apdecker tells us in the book american negro slave Rev revolts he tells us that there were over 250 documented revolts. In other words, back during that time, Europeans were very meticulous in documenting these things because they were trying to put things in place to make sure that these things never happened again, that revolts never occurred. So they documented whenever there was a revolt. Well, we know that there was Gaspar Yanga and Nanny of the Maroons down in Mexico. And we know about the Haitian Revolution, whom, which we'll talk about a little bit later with uh, Bukman Dudi and uh, Dessalines and Toussaint Louverture. Probably the most well-known revolt that many of us have heard of would be that of Nat Turner, okay? Uh, the three most prominent revolts amongst Africans in America was Nat Turner, Denmark VC and Gabriel Prosser. And then there was also the Stono Rebellion in South Carolina. But in large measure, we were never taught about those Africans who actually won their freedom and created sovereign maroon communities. We love uh, General Nat Turner and Denmark VC and Gabriel Prosser for the sacrifice that they made. Certainly these are monumental Africans but in the end, in their quest for liberation, they were killed. But you and I need to understand that there were those who were successful, who defeated their captors and went on to establish free, liberated, and sovereign communities and even nations. Okay. The other thing that I, the other uh, myth that I want to put to rest and dispel is the notion that we didn't fight back. In my research, one of the things that I've come to understand is that we were all always either planning a revolt in the midst of a revolt or coming out of a revolt. Remember, there are over 250 documented revolts in American history. That tells us it was at least one was happening per year. And so we were always either planning a revolt in the midst of a revolt or coming out of a revolt. We didn't just accept our enslavement and, and lay down and allow it to happen. Certainly there were those Africans who were 
terrorized into such a state of fear and compliance that they did, but overwhelmingly, we never accepted our captivity. We never accepted enslavement. We were always either planning a revolt in the midst of a revolt or coming out of a revolt. And so I'd like to suggest that, that we not accept a lot of the oppressive circumstances that we see going on today, that we need to study the mentality of the Maroons. How were they able to overthrow the yoke of oppression? How were they able to establish their own communities and even countries and establish and maintain their sovereignty? These are the things that I want us to think about because you can get so caught up in seeking equity that you give up the notion of achieving sovereignty. And sovereignty is complete self-sufficiency but I'll give a more comprehensive definition of sovereignty a little bit later. I wanna highly encourage you to look at uh, the Haitian revolution and study what they did. Makandal, Bukman, Dessalines, and Toussaint. Uh, and you may have seen, if you haven't seen it, you should see 1804, The Hidden History of Haiti. That came out in 2017, uh, an amazing production from the producer of Hidden Colors. Um, just a very well done documentary. I highly recommend it that you take a look at it. And if you've already seen it, it would be worth watching again and again, because this is an example of Africans who not only resisted oppression, but overthrew their captors to the point of producing Haiti as the first free republic in the Western Hemisphere. And when they defeated the French, the French were arguably the strongest military in the world at that time. And they beat the French so bad that in order to recoup some of their losses, the general, the French general Napoleon had to sell off some of France's colonized or conquered lands. And the defeat of the French by the Haitians is what led to the selling of the Louisiana Territory, or what we know today as the Louisiana Purchase, which contained a lot more than just what we know as today, the state of Louisiana. It contained a great deal of that land mass, mass in the South and Southwest. And so Napoleon had to sell that off just to recoup some of the losses that he experienced in the Haitian Revolution. So they are the quintessential example of maroonage. And we can uh, learn a lot about the mentality of the maroons from studying about the Haitian revolution. This presentation is just introductory in nature to get you into the thinking, the mentality and the mindset of the maroons. One of our great elders in Wali Mubaruti tells us in his book, Toward, Notes Toward Higher Ideals, in African intellectual liberation, he says, the most concrete evidence of warriorhood is seen in action, consistent long-term action. And so you should ask yourself, take a mental inventory right now, who are those Africans that I know who have been in it to win it? And I'm talking about from the time that you knew them to now, I'm talking about for years, for decades, when it was popular, when it was unpopular, in season and out of season, who are those consistent Africans that you have seen engaged in action, consistent long-term action in building businesses, in building schools or other institutions, in educating the people? Who are those people who have been involved in consistent long-term action? Because that's one of the greatest evidences of warriorhood and maroonage. And we should all be thinking along those lines. And I want you to know it's not easy to persist for years and for decades, because I'm one that has three decades in the struggle. And I once heard somebody say, they attributed these words to Malcolm X, though I don't know if Malcolm said it or not, but these are some really tremendous words that I, uh, that I can definitely resonate with. And, and, and the, the quote says, it's easier to stand up than it is to stay up. I want you to think about that for a minute. It's easier to stand up than to stay up. 
to be consistently committed to this kind of work over a long period of time, or for our, for our maroon ancestors to be committed to the death for not only the liberation of our people, but for us to return to sovereignty, complete self-sufficiency over everything that we have, all right? And so now uh, we've looked at resistance. Now in session three, we wanna look at persistence persistence, all right? And Dr. Hillier gives us some further clarification about Maroons and the mentality of Maroons. He says, intellectual Maroonage is not just escape, but establishment of alternative ways of knowing and being in the world. When he's talking about intellectual Maroonage, and there's a brother by the name of uh, Dr. Uhuru Imhotep, I'm sorry, Uhuru Hotep, who has written about intellectual maroonage. And that is those professors among us and scholars and researchers who refuse to participate in basically in Western scholarly ways and who have chosen a completely different path based on maroonage, where we are researching um, our best traditions and and, and lifting those up and reconstructing them and putting them back into the hands of those uh, that created them. So Dr. Hillier tells us intellectual maroonage is not just escape, but establishment of alternative ways of knowing and being in the world. And certainly Dr. Hillier would be an example of that intellectual maroonage. Other intellectual maroons would include uh, Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, Dr. Marimba Ani, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Naeem Akbar, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Imwalimu Baruti, uh, so many different ones that, that we can call our attention to who have rescued and reconstructed our history and culture and put it back into our hands. Dr. Malana Karinga, Dr. Sheikh Antadia, Dr. Theophilo Benga, uh, my elder and my jegna, Dr. Joyce King, so many, all right? In addition to that, he tells us intellectual maroonage is not just about resistance, but restoration, restoration of traditional ways. And this is a very, very important point because we can get so caught up in resisting oppression that we never build anything. One more time, we can get so caught up in resisting oppression that we never build anything. So the question that I have for you now is what are you building? Not you as an individual, but what organization are you a part of that is building something? Each of us, as, as Kwame uh, Toure used to say, organize, 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 because um, institutions will always defeat individuals. So we need to be a part of institutions and uh, and be about the business of building institutions. So what institution or organization are you a part of? Because intellectual maroonage is not just about resistance. Resistance is important, but that's not all it is. It's about restoration. Restoration of what? Our traditional ways, all right? So we've got to find this delicate balance now between protest and production. You see, if I'm so involved in protest, whenever somebody says something or does something that I don't like, and now I want to protest it, and I want to make people aware of it, and, and tell them what they said was wrong, or what they did was wrong, and hold up picket signs and march and different things like that, there is a time for that. I don't mean to downplay that. There is a time for that. But if we're not careful, we can get so wrapped up in protest, again, that we're not producing anything. So how do we find the balance between protest and production? How can we cultivate a climate of production of the things that make us more self-sufficient and less vulnerable to white terrorism? And less vulnerable to black on black self-hate. And this is something that we have to think of as we dig deep into the mentality of the Maroons. They were about producing a different reality, not just protesting the current reality. One more time, they weren't just about protesting the current reality, they were about producing a new reality. What new reality are you and I producing? 
What organization or institution are we a part of that is doing that? This is part of the mentality of the Maroons. And so what systems then do we need to have in place? If we say, okay, we're gonna be Maroons, we're going to escape the madness. Well, that comes with the price to be paid. That, that comes with certain things that need to be put in place. So what systems do we need to have in place for food? I mean, when the pandemic hit and we were seeing on the evening news, we were seeing lines upon lines of cars lined up to get food because the supply lines had been interrupted and disrupted. So what systems do we have in place for food for our people? Are we growing our own food? Are we building our own gardens? Or do we have a reciprocal relationship with black farmers to be able to support them so that they can provide us with the essential foods that we need? Something to think about. These are questions that Maroons ask. But these aren't just questions that Maroons ask. These are solutions that Maroons put in place. Another thing we have to consider, what about water? clean, drinkable water? What about education? Who will educate our children? We've seen the destabilization of public schooling and even prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, our children were not being properly served. And now they've gone a year and a half uh, without face-to-face -face instruction in many cases. And so we have to make appropriations for education. And we have many Maroon educators in our midst. Here in the Atlanta area, you have Quilombo Pan-African Institute. And Quilombo was a Maroon nation. And so Quilombo School is named after a Maroon nation. OK? Uh, so we have the Quilombo Pan-African Institute. Uh, we have Akobin Institute. We have Aya Educational Institute. We've got Pearl Academy. We've got Saba Academy online, which my wife founded, okay? Um, so let me go back and run down that list real quick, okay? We got Quilombo, which was founded by Sister Aminata Umoja, okay? We have Aya Educational Institute, founded by Wakesa and Afia Madzamoyo. We have uh, Pearl Academy. We have Akobin Institute, founded by uh, Imwalimu and Mama Ya Baruti. And, and then we have Saba Academy Online, founded by Mama Willette Akua. So we have a lot of options available to us. Are we taking advantage of them? Some of these schools are in person. Some of them are online. Some of them are in person and online. But we need to take advantage of our education as a people. And at no time in our history have we had access to technology the way that we do now in order to do that. So we have to have this mentality of the Maroons that we're going to take back the education of our children. Here's something else Maroons think of, health. Health. You know, we've seen a lot of brothers and sisters who are taking back their own health and finding the best ways to boost our immune systems in the midst of this pandemic. We need some maroon health warriors who are going to teach us natural ways of healing. OK, but not only health, we know a, a large component of health is mental health. But I'm putting that as a separate bullet point, because even prior to COVID-19, we were dealing with um intergenerational, multi-generational, unaddressed trauma. I'm going to say that again. Even prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, we were dealing with intergenerational, passed down from generation to generation, multi-generational, many different generations exposed to this, unaddressed trauma. When I say unaddressed trauma, I'm talking about physical mutilation and beating and abuse happened every day on the plantation. Sexual abuse of males and females, boys and girls happening every day on the plantation. And we are 400 years without therapy. 
So if we're going to be maroons, we have to take our mental health into account because many of us are in need of, of, of counseling to address unaddressed trauma, all right? And then safety and security. How are we going to secure our neighborhoods and our communities? If police brutality is a problem, how do we then learn how to police our own communities to keep them safe and to make them safe once again? What, these are some of the systems that we have to have in place if we're going to be seeking and striving for sovereignty as the Maroons did. This is part of what it means to have the mentality of the Maroons. So that leads to session four, our final session on sovereignty. You've heard me use this term several times, uh, but I want to define it for you so that we're very clear what we mean when we say sovereignty. My definition of sovereignty is very simply this, community control with African continental connections. Community control, we control the politics, the education, the economics of our own communities, but we also have African continental connections. And those African continental, continental connections serve to help us to understand the culture and to forge relations and alliances with our brothers and sisters on the continent so that we can um, assist them and they can assist us. Our brothers and sisters on the continent are standing on top of the wealth of the world, the natural resources of gold, diamonds, silver, oil, petroleum, bauxite, all of the different resources needed for us to have the way of life that we do here in America and in the West in general, those resources come largely out of Africa as Africa is still being raped and robbed and pillaged for its resources. So sovereignty is community control with African cultural connections, continental connections. Sovereignty suggests African management of its natural resources rather than foreign manipulation of its natural resources. So Maroons controlled their entire area, whether they were going up into the hills and the mountains of Jamaica, or whether they were going into the swamps of North Carolina and South Carolina and Florida and Georgia, they controlled their entire area and they managed the resources of, of those areas. So sovereignty suggests African management of its natural resources rather than foreign manipulation of its natural resources. And here on this map, you can see all the different places and the different uh, natural resources that Africa has in the area of iron ore, fish, gold, cocoa beans, petroleum, diamonds, copper, platinum, coffee, livestock, uh, natural gas, all of these different things, textiles, phosphates, okay? But most of these resources are under foreign control, manipulation, and domination. The mentality of the Maroons says we will control our own resources and use them in the building of our new reality. So once again, I ask you, what systems do we need to have in place for food, for water, for shelter, for education, for health, for mental health, for safety and security, and any and everything that we would want in our own communities and in our own nations? These are the things that Maroons have to think about. This goes far beyond the quest for equity and deals with sovereignty. Sovereignty is community control plus African continental connections, all right? So with that in mind, I wanna point you towards a resource that my family and I have developed in our quest for sovereignty, in our quest to activate the mentality of the Maroons, knowing that one of the systems that my family um, has committed itself to dealing with is this issue of education, educating our own. And so a number of years ago, when I taught in the public school system, I was a language arts teacher 
And later on in that career, the last three years of my career in public education, I was a reading specialist. Now, all during my time as a, uh, as a language arts teacher, I always developed my own lesson plans, my own um, activities, my own quizzes, worksheets, tests, all of those different kinds of things. I rarely, if ever, taught from the teacher's edition or the curriculum that I was given to teach from because it did not meet the unique needs of the students that I was teaching. So when I became a reading specialist, they sent to me all of the students who had not passed the state test in reading. But they said, Mr. Akua, uh, we don't have a curriculum for this program. I said, no problem because if they had given me one, I probably wouldn't have taught from it anyway, because it would not have been culturally responsive to the needs of my students. So I developed a curriculum. Every day, I would write up a brief reading selection about an African or African-American hero or shero. And I would add to it 10 multiple choice questions to mimic the structure of the state test and reading. But of course, the content was about African or African-American heroes and sheroes. This is an example of one of them. And I know you can't read this, but I want you to see on the left-hand side, you have the reading selection. On the right-hand side, you have the, uh, the, the 10 multiple choice questions. The intent was to increase reading comprehension, vocabulary development, writing and critical thinking skills and test-taking skills. But the main thing in addition to that was cultural awareness or cultural competence. Because you could have all those other things. You could know how to read, vocabulary development, all that kind of stuff. You could have all of that. But if you didn't have the cultural awareness, the cultural competence, you won't know what to do with those skills to advocate on behalf of your people and your community. So it's about cultural excellence and academic excellence. You can't have one without the other. It's two sides of the same coin. So often, however, we go through the schools of miseducation only getting very basic skills, if that, and none of the cultural competence. And so we learn how to meet needs and solve problems for other people, but don't know how to meet needs and solve problems for ourselves. But if we're gonna take on the mentality of the Maroons, then we have to know our history, our traditions, our culture. And that was the purpose of writing up these activities. And after writing up about 30 of these, Spirit began to speak uh, into my spirit and say, hey, this is a book. If you and, and other uh, and your students need this, then other teachers and other students need this. And so I called upon my good friend, uh, a master teacher by the name of Tavara Stevens, and he helped me to write some more of these. And we came up with the book Reading Revolution, which is a collection of 90 reading selections like this of African and African American heroes and she rose. And then the 10 multiple choice questions. Well, then we did something very special. I called my family together a couple of years ago. This was prior to the start of COVID-19. And I told them the vision of how I wanted to create Reading Revolution Online, an online interactive platform where we would have captioned videos of each of the 90 reading selections, plus activities for students to complete that would help them to increase their reading comprehension, vocabulary development, writing and critical thinking skills, and cultural competence. And this is the Reading Revolution team. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them later, but before I do, let me show you the online platform. Because what I want to do is, as I walk through this online platform, I want you to go to Reading revolution.org because there's a demo on that website readingrevolution.org and when you go in and you click on uh, getting that demo you'll be able to see a number of the things similar to what I'm going to show you uh, in just a moment here so remember we want to have this mentality of the maroons so that we can create what we need for our people rather than waiting for somebody else to create it for us. So here is the Reading Revolution platform. As you can see, each of the reading selections are numbered, 
right? But in between each of those numbers are several activities for each of the 90 reading selections and each of the captioned videos. So I'm gonna play one of these for you. Hold on, let me come out of this for just a second. I wanna make sure that the sound is on that you'll be able to hear when I play the video, all right? So we're gonna learn about Ahmed Baba and the University of San Kare. So what we do is we start off with a power quote. Books are worth their weight in gold. This is an African proverb. And if I was teaching, I would ask my students, if books are worth their weight in gold, what's your favorite book? Or what's a book that transformed your life? Man, I have several that I can think of. One of the first was by Dr. Naeem Akbar, Breaking the Chains of Psychological Slavery. Another one would be the autobiography of Malcolm X. Another one would be Asa Hilliard's of Saba, The Reawakening of the African Mind. I have a number of books that are worth their weight in gold to me, right? But what about you? What's your favorite book or one that transformed your life? After we examine that, we do our Boabab vocabulary. We call it Boabab vocabulary because as you may be aware, the Boabab tree is uh, known in African culture as the African tree of life because the people in the village use that tree uh, for all of their resources. And so the reason we call it Boabab vocabulary is because when you do these activities, it will bring life to your comprehension and communication skills and your critical thinking skills. So these are the words that students will encounter in the reading selection and in the captioned video. As we scroll down, there's the captioned video and there is the text. What you see in the captioned video is exactly what you will see in the text. Now, most of the videos are right around three minutes. This one is just under three minutes, okay? And so I'm gonna play this video for you so, so that you can get a, a sense of what it's like. And I'm gonna turn the caption on so that you can see that as well. Pay very close attention because we're going to do a comprehension assessment shortly after. Remember, we're still dealing with the mentality of the Maroons and Maroons produce for themselves. And this is the area that uh, my family and I are producing in. Ahmed Baba and the University of San Kore. From the 1300s to the 1700s, Timbuktu was one of the greatest cities in all of Africa. Situated near the Niger River, this great center of learning was known throughout the land. It was also an important trading center for gold, salt, iron, and books. Timbuktu had quite a reputation for educational excellence and wealth, so much so that students and scholars came from all over Africa, Asia, and Europe to study at the famed University of San Kore. Being near the river gave people easy access to this thriving city of trade and education and attracted many people. Ahmed Baba was the president of the University of San Kore for 30 years. During this time, he upheld the African standard of excellence, running the university with great vision. Also during this time, he authored 42 books. This means he wrote more than one book per year in addition to his duties as president. Additionally, Ahmed Baba had over 1,600 books that he owned in his personal library. This shows that he knew the power of books to transform the mind. To Africans who introduced the art of writing to the world, books were sacred and holy. Books were valued so much that people paid for books using only gold. The book a person desired to purchase would be placed on one side of a scale and gold dust would be sprinkled on the other side of the scale until the scales were balanced. Books in Timbuktu and in the empires of Mali and Songhai were literally worth their weight in gold. Because of this, the book industry was just as lucrative as the gold, salt, and iron industries. People who studied at Timbuktu learned law, medicine, and healing, writing, and literature, astronomy, the study of the stars, and agriculture, the study of farming, and much more. They took their knowledge and understanding of what they learned back to other parts of Africa, Asia, and Europe. Some even came to America. 
History also shows us that virtually every home in Timbuktu had an extensive library of books and manuscripts. All right, so this is an example of one of our captioned videos. Remember, there are 90 in all. And remember, the caption video is directly related to this reading selection. That's what you were seeing in the captions. As you can see in the reading selection, uh, your Boabab vocabulary words are underlined, so they're easy to find. When you scroll down a little bit further, what you see is our Boabab vocabulary activity. And in this particular one, you see the word on the left-hand side, and then you see the definitions on the right-hand side, but you got to match them up. This is a what we would call a click and drag activity. So, for example, we know that astronomy is the study of the stars. So we're going to click that and drag it all the way. Whoops. Let me go back down for a second. We're going to click that and drag it up to where it says astronomy. All right. Right there. OK. And then we know that agriculture is the study of farming. Astronomy is the study of the stars. Agriculture is the study of farming. Let's see. We got to you know, some more that we can match up. Sacred means holy. They're not usually right next to each other like that, but sometimes they are. We know, we know lucrative means profitable. So a student can go through these vocabulary activities and then click at the bottom and the system will score it for them, okay? But then not only that, after we do the Boabab vocabulary activity, then we have the comprehension quest activity. And that is the 10 multiple choice questions. I'm going to reset this test so I can just walk you through it real quick to give you an idea of what you will encounter. As you can see, we'll have some, some of our Boabab vocabulary words in there. I'm going to put the wrong answer for this one. The word situated means located. But I'm going to put the wrong answer here just so that you can see how uh, it will be scored by the system. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put a wrong answer for a couple of these so that you can see how the system will score it. Okay, uh, let's go a little bit further. Run through these real quick. And the great thing about this is, again, some of the different Boabab vocabulary words show up in the comprehension quest like this. But this enhances our students' critical thinking skills uh, as they look at the different answer choices, and they can always refer back to the actual text also. So as you can see, I got a 90 on this. The system will show them which question they got wrong, what answer they put, and what the correct answer is. And it will also show them the correct answer to the ones that they got correct as well. All right. So we've done our Boabab vocabulary activity. We've done our comprehension quest activity. The third activity for each of these is the grammar review. And in the grammar review, the student then has to rewrite each of these sentences which contain content from the reading selection. They have to rewrite each sentence adding capitalization, punctuation, and changing verb tense where necessary. Now we don't have time for me to do all that right now, but I'm just going to put that little bit in there so that you can see how it scores it. Of course I'm going to get a zero because that's all I wrote in, but you can see the grammar review is going to increase and improve students writing skills. But in addition to that, we not only have the grammar review to help with writing skills, if we're gonna have a reading revolution, then we also need to have a writing revolution. So each of the 90 reading selections has a writing prompt. This particular one says, Ahmed Baba wrote 42 books. If you were going to write a book, what would it be about? Would it be fiction or nonfiction? Who would the book be for? What age range or audience? Describe and explain. So the student would then type in this box. They would type a paragraph, two paragraphs, or even a page, depending on the specifications of the teacher or the parent. 
Now, the system does not score this. The teacher or parent would have to score it according to their purposes. But it allows the student to react and respond to the text and what they just read. OK, so again, Reading Revolution online contains 90 of these reading selections and captioned videos. So you got 90 reading selections, 90 captioned videos. You got 90 comprehension quest assessments. You've got 90 grammar reviews and 90 writing revolution prompts. This is a tremendous, tremendous resource for parents. And parents love this information because many of them didn't receive it growing up either. But you know, having done, um, uh, shared this with uh, superintendents and principals, literally from New York to California, they're telling me, Dr. Kua, we, we've never seen anything like this. And it's already even being used in Canada as well. So this is uh, being used nationally and internationally. I invite you on that same journey. So go to readingrevolution.org and you can get a free demo that includes a number of these different caption videos and reading selections. Okay, now let me go back for just a moment so that I can share with you the Reading Revolution team because they're the ones that have done a phenomenal job of helping me to put this together. The Reading Revolution team uh, consists of a number of members of my family. So as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, there's Mama Waleta Kua, who many of you know. Uh, she's the founder of Saba Academy Online, but she also uh, did the editing and voiceovers for a number of the captioned videos. So you won't just be hearing a male voice, you'll be hearing a female voice on at least half of the videos. Then uh, right here, uh, we have uh, my oldest son, Jabari, who is a computer engineering and game design major. Um, he did the audio engineering for each of the captioned videos. My son Amari is a film um, major. He's an award-winning filmmaker uh, who is a film major in college. And uh, he is responsible for the captioned videos. But when he saw the scope and the scale of this project, he asked his girlfriend, Ayana, to give him a hand because she's an outstanding video editor as well. And she's a student in communications. And so uh, they have done all of the caption videos. And then my niece, Kaylee, did some of the voiceovers and editing as well. So it's been a family affair. In addition to this, we have my co-author, Tavara Stevens, an amazing minister and spoken word artist and writer who helped with the writing of Reading Revolution. And then um, what else is amazing is we have an amazing a web designer and site administrator named Jennifer Jackson, uh, who was able to take the ideas that I have and put them in this online platform. Okay, so we're very proud to bring this to you. And we want to encourage you to share this with other people. Again, you can go to readingrevolution.org, readingrevolution.org to learn more about that. Now, again, why did I share that with you? I shared that with you because the mentality of the Maroons is that we must produce for ourselves what we ourselves need. So we're not waiting for another large publishing company to put these things together for us. Just as I didn't wait for a large publishing company to help me publish my 11 books, we did that on our own as a self-conscious self uh, as a self-conscious act of self-determination because our area in my family is education we are in a sense educational maroons though we have worked in different schools and school systems and things like that and while i enjoy working at clark atlanta university i'm blessed to be there on the faculty in the department of educational leadership we also understand that we must create independent spaces that we control as a people. And I invite you on that same journey in whatever, in whatever area of expertise that you have. So what is your area of expertise? What organization are you a part of? 
what are you doing to help us to cultivate this mentality of the Maroons and build institutions and organizations to restore us as a people and to carry us forward? These are the questions that I want you to consider. And as I begin to close, uh, there are just a couple of quotes that I want you uh, to think about. And the quotes that I want you to think about as we close, uh, oh, before I get to that, regarding education. As I mentioned, Mama Waletakua has launched Saba Academy online. So whether your student, your child, your grandchild, your nephew, your niece, or neighbor's child, whoever may be interested, let them know whether, uh, whether they're being homeschooled and need a class in, in language arts and writing and, and history during the day, they can enroll and have that taught to them by a qualified teacher at Sable Academy online during the school day. But if that child is enrolled in, a, in, a, in another school, but they need enrichment in those areas in the evening, afternoon or evening, uh, they can enroll in Sable Academy online and have a qualified teacher to teach them the Reading Revolution curriculum as well. So if you or someone that you know is interested, go to sabaacademyschool.com. Again, that's sabaacademyschool.com. And we're still enrolling, all right? So I leave you with these two final quotes as we have talked about the mentality of the Maroons. Please remember, this has just been an introductory presentation to get you thinking along the lines of the mentality of the Maroons. A subsequent follow-up presentation would delve deeper into, into the Maroon leaders like Dessaline, Bukman, Toussaint, uh, Makandal, uh, Gaspar Yanga, Nanny of the Maroons, and many, many others. But this was just an introduction to the mentality of the Maroons. So I leave you with these two quotes. The first is by Fannie Lou Hamer. She said, never forget where we came from and always praise the bridges that carried you over. And lastly, if you dream of moving mountains tomorrow, you must first begin by moving small stones today. And I believe that with this presentation, we've moved a, sm a few small stones so that tomorrow we can move mountains. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening. My name is Dr. Chika Akua. Peace and blessings.